Welcome back to another episode of the Packs What She Said podcast. I am one of your co-hosts, Perry Goldstein, uh, flipping the script a little bit on hosting duties today, uh, joined as always by Maggie Loney. And we have a very special guest um, who has recently been on, Dusty Evely, um, to talk about the Packers' new defensive coordinator, who was a little bit of a surprise for us. Um, so we thought we would have um, Dusty come on, who has watched um, a decent amount of Boston College and Ohio State tape to give us a little breakdown of what he's seen from Jeff Halfley uh, as the new DC. But Dusty, happy Friday. Welcome. How you doing? Uh Happy Friday. I'm doing great. I'm so excited. I feel like I just talked to you guys, what, like a week and a half, two weeks ago? It was not that long ago, so I'm thrilled to be back and talking to you all again. Uh, doing a little ball. Packer season is over, but still fun things to talk about. I'm so excited to be here. We're so happy to have you, and we're so glad that you uh, have any and all knowledge on this man. <laughs> because we, Maggie and I did a defensive coordinator breakdown show not too long ago. We went through tons of names mm -hmm. tons of names i thought maggie put together a wonderful list of names <laughs> full of you know your your mainstays your not surprises some fun you know up and comers and then at the end of the episode we said the packers are definitely going to choose someone out of left field yeah. and obviously the Packers went and chose someone out of left field um this was a name that I didn't even see floating in the ether. I don't even think we got an interview update. Like they brought him in in a Trojan under, horse. Under cover of know. night, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I guess the back, I mean, at this point, I'm sure listeners are well aware, but Jeff was in the NFL for a number of years. He was a DB's coach with San Francisco, with the Browns. Um, there's another team. Technically the Bills, right but uh, okay. he didn't actually work there. He with the Niners. He was there with the Niners. I know yeah, as well. San Francisco mm -hmm. with, under Shanahan. Um, he has affiliations with Robert Sala. So this kind of Shanahan-Sala scheme. Then he left the NFL, right, to go work um, as the defensive coordinator at Ohio State, a co-defensive coordinator, mm -hmm. but defensive coordinator nonetheless um, for a very, very good Ohio State defense, um, a number of first round picks and others um, that were drafted that year. And then he more recently took over the BC football uh, program as the head coach. Um, there's been a number of interviews floating around with him just talking about how much he loves calling the defensive side of the ball. Um, he seems to be very passionate about defensive scheme and um, also being very excited to just come back to the NFL, which is kind of where he made his start. So um, I'm excited about it. I know transparently for our listeners, very little about this man. <laughs> I'm still learning along with you. <laughs> but how's everybody feeling before we dive into like the tape? How's everybody feeling about this hire? Because it's been a few days. So we've had some time to digest, read some things. How are we feeling? I mean, I think it was kind of funny because I, I think I was like making dinner. I don't even remember what I was doing. And Mark was like, oh, congrats on the new DC. And I'm like, who? <laughs> You're like, what? <laughs> and then he's like, oh, Jeff Halfley. And I'm like, that means nothing to me. You know, like I, I like I know some college coaches. Jack Heflin? No. Yeah, I'm like, no. Ooh, what? <laughs> <laughs> the trash can full of dirt is coaching in the NFL now. But yeah, so it was one of those like, oh, I'll have to do some more research. And then once I sat down and like, you know, people started um, like pulling clips. Shout out to Joey, who uh, found some some cut ups right away of like his defensive philosophy. Like it was really exciting because everything I kept seeing was like, oh, so it's like the anti Joe Barry. Like it, the, I was like, OK, I'm in like whatever, whatever other research I need to do, I, I'm in. Yeah, the first thing I saw was uh, when I was pulling stuff up was like, here's a 40 minute clinic on press man. I was like, oh, here we go. Oh, here we go. Yeah, I, I was kind of off the Internet for a while. So I found out from I've got a group chat with my brothers who are big, big Packers fans. My youngest brother specifically is like huge into the college world. He's into he's on college recruiting message boards like he's he's deep into this world of following this stuff. So he knew him 
because apparently Halfley is a very was a very well regarded recruiter. Apparently, uh, like Florida, Georgia, Alabama were all trying to get him on their staff as a defensive coach, but also as a recruiter. So he spoke highly of him before I even really look, looked into him. So I, I was kind of same with you guys. I the, all those names. I feel like we tracked so much, dude. We tracked so much of like the interviews and informed opinion about these guys and all of this. And I think later then we found out like Wink Martindale was apparently in for an interview that we yeah, didn't know yeah. about. So didn't even know. they just announced the ones that like, uh, here, here's the names you probably want to hear. And they sneak in a handful of people underneath. So my, my initial response was just came from my brother knowing him. And I was like, I don't know much about him, but he's excited about him. So that's good. And then the more I kind of read and I, I watched that entire 40 minute press man uh, thing, which was, which was cool. And the, the more I got into it, I went from, I don't know who this guy is. I don't know how I feel about it too. I'm still, I'm still hedging a little bit, but I think vibes are high. I think I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm getting, getting more hyped about it for sure. Yeah. I, I think my take on it is again, like I'm still learning about his scheme. And I think to be honest, we're not going to know anything until he starts to come into the building and we see how this defense looks on the field. Right. Cause right now it's all, speculation and theoretical and we can look at kind of some of the things that he's put on tape and think about the way it will translate to the Packers and that's all well and good and we won't really know um what I really like about him I think big picture is that I really like that he has experience in the NFL he was a DB's coach he's been around the league he's worked under some really you know successful coaching trees, um, guys who have also coached very successful defenses. Sala, you know, Shanahan's an offensive guy, but obviously a very successful coach. Then he left and he said, I'm going to do, I want to call my own defense. I'm going to go do this my way. Um, and it meant doing that in the college, in the college world. Okay, fine. Not in the NFL. Um, but he was very successful. Okay. It's one year, but small sample size, but it was very successful. Um, and then he went and got his head coaching gig, which you can say what you want about it, but I think it's fair to say the BC program was one that needed to be totally overhauled. It's not, you know, your big SEC, et cetera, with all the resources. There's lots of variables in the college world at the moment that probably limit um, your ability to be successful. And um potentially stifle your ability to turn around a small program really quickly. So I don't judge him too harshly on the BC, but more so what he was able to do as a defensive play caller. So I like that he has kind of both of that, right? He's going to bring some fun things from college. He has NFL experience, right? He's not just like a college guy who's never worked in the NFL before. Yeah. Cause Maggie and I have said on the show, I don't love, that idea of someone who's like green in the NFL because it's a very different game. Um, and he even talked about that in an interview, like acknowledging the differences, especially on defense calling between the college and, and NFL. Um, so I think it's a really nice synergistic marriage of his experience coming um, and now being in DC in green Bay. Um, again, I have no idea what it's going to look like on the field. Um, I think we'll dive into Dusty, some of the things you've seen on tape, but I think ex his experience in terms of like steps in your career wise, this like makes sense. Mm -hmm. And like one of the things that I, I saw too right away immediately, cause there's always, you know, takes the second that a decision is made. And one of them was that the Boston college defense had not been, incredibly successful under his leadership. And I think the argument there, you know, on the flip side of that is also the talent pool that you're looking at. He went from Ohio state and those pieces, Jeff Akuda, who I'm sure we're going to get into later in the show to a Boston college defense where the last defensive player drafted was Isaiah McDuffie. And I've always loved Boston college because of one BJ Raji and some other Harold Landry, some players that I really liked out of Boston college, but they historically do not have, you know, the same prowess in just on that side of the ball in general. Zay flowers obviously just came from there on the offensive side, but yeah, really hard to evaluate a one AJ Dillon do one AJ. Well, yeah, but I mean like it's hard to evaluate what he was able to do when the talent pool is not, like you said, the resources are not what they are at Ohio State in Boston College. No, for sure. Yeah, and that's the tricky thing. And that was when I was watching it, that's what was kind of fun. So I started with 
2023 Boston College because my my thought process is like I know Ohio State. Everyone was talking, watch Ohio State, watch Ohio State. I knew that's a different animal, and also like four years is a long time in football. Mm-hmm. So like as far as like a lot of the sim pressure, creeper pressures, all the stuff that's been in vogue a lot more lately. I want to see how that's kind of incorporated in his game. And so I started 2023, and it looks a certain way. And we can talk about that in a second. And so I watched four, I think I'm five or six games through 2023. Now I went back to Ohio State. It looks wildly different because again they mentioned it's like it's it's chase young it's what pete werner uh jeff akuda uh tough borland like there's that defense is stacked like you look at that and that was straight four down linemen linebackers hugged up close because they could recover because all those guys had speed press man at the edges all those guys like there was two inches between the cornerback and the wide receiver like they're in their face in a single high safety and then you go to boston college and it's it's much more the corners are off they're still being aggressive but the corners were off they had one safety that was kind of high but offset another one kind of milling around back there the linebackers were set back a little bit deeper because they could rally to the ball but then for the for the passes they like it was just all of these things that you could see and that's what i kind of thought was was fun about it fun it's fun about it was <laughs> watching this and going like, okay, you could see like, you can see the bones of what he wants to do. Like they're still roughly the same, but he couldn't do that. And I've not gone back to like his first year of BC, but he couldn't do what he wanted to do clearly with the guys he had. So he took whatever his bones, whatever the bones of his scheme were, whatever he really wanted to accomplish and molded that around the guys he could do now. And they were still like, I was watching, uh, I think the FSU game last night, which was one of those, <laughs> everything looked great. Like everything you could tell, like, I think there's motion pre-snap and there's communication. The guy's hand signal, they motion, they, they spin the safeties around to take care of like the jet motion. They have a switch release at the line. The guys cover that up perfectly. It's a play action linebacker comes up when he sees the crosser behind him. He turns, he does like the robot thing where he turns, finds the crosser. The only problem is that that linebacker ran, I swear to God, like a four, nine, five. So he could not catch up with the writers. It was one of those like, everyone was what they were doing, what they were supposed to be doing like clearly like all the lessons they had all those drilled everyone knew exactly what they're supposed to be doing but then at the end of it like well the talent just couldn't keep up you had you had a linebacker who like was clearly not fit to keep up with an fsu wide receiver on like a four four across the field like that that just kind of happens but the way one of the things that's one of the things i've listening to different things about half i think people talking about him what everyone says is what a good teacher he is. Mm -hmm. And that's, what's been so good. That's the thing, like the communication, you can see that on the field, you can see the pre-snap, you can see the post-snap, you see the way that they pass stuff off. You can tell he used to be a DB coach because of that stuff. And that's what I think more than anything, that's what excited me was how much like to a man, everyone's saying like, we love him. He's, he's a good teacher, good communicator, good teacher. Then you hear him talk and he talks about how much he loves the kids, how much he loves like coaching ball. And it sounds like one of the reasons he left BC, as you were kind of alluding to, he wants to coach ball. And he talked about that. Was that the Adam Brenneman podcast? He did like the Mm -hmm. day before he was hired. It was something to the effect of, I think he said like all the NIL and transfer portals. He goes, I don't have a problem with the NIL stuff. I get, get your money, but there's no rules around this. And it's just the wild, wild West. And like, he's got two small kids and it's, you can't, there's no stop in this. And so it kind of sounds like a guy who like, I just want to coach football. Like he seems yeah. like a good coach, well-respected, good communicator. And then you can see him change up his scheme with the guys that he has. He just wants to coach ball. So I'm after kind of reading through a bunch and watching those games, I, I certainly feel better about it than I did. Cause there is a, there's a level of flexibility there um, that you could, that is very apparent if you jump from 2019 to 2023, which is a lot of fun. And I mean, I think it's really easy for these guys to say the right thing. So you're always waiting, Mm -hmm. of course, for the application of it, talking about like, we're going to adjust mid game and, you know, even, you know, on the same drive, if we have to, like some situations are going to call, like he plays like cover one and he's like, there's a lot of situations in the NFL where that is not possible. So you have to shade different looks, you know, like everybody can say the right things. He can preach like, you know, the fundamentals of tackling and you believe it. It sounds good. I am obviously invested in what he has to say i think he's saying the right things and i think he fully can deliver i have no reason to think that he can't but there is you know a point where it's like okay we've kind of seen it through a little bit of what we've seen from him in the college game and the way that players speak so highly of him but how he actually comes in and does it i think is where Mm -hmm. now fans are like okay you're saying like everything sounds great sounds awesome now let's like see it with these guys on defense yeah I mean, that's, I mean, that's the whole thing, right? Is that we're, we're dissecting old film and looking at interviews, but 
it's going to be all about like how they come in in preseason and training camp and like what we actually see on the field. I mean, I'm excited to see what he does to your point, Dusty, when to talent, like mm-hmm. what he does with the talent, because we have talked ad nauseum, I think about like on paper, this Packers defense has all of these like chess pieces and Gu- loves to draft these like super athletic freaky you know, players. And like to Dusty, to your example, you just gave, I mean, you put in a Quay Walker in that situation, right? Mm-hmm. And he has the speed to run, right? And it's, can you coach a guy up to be able to execute on that when he has the athletic ability to do that? If you can get a guy like Jeff in to do that and bring that level of like talent ability out of your players, then like, wow, we, okay, like, let's go, like, let's get running here. Like, that's amazing. I mean, he has some amazing pieces to work with on this defense that I think we've been waiting to kind of watch it all come together. Um, I mean, between like Jair, (laughs) obviously, um, to Rashawn Gary being kind of your two cornerstone, more veteran players that you can kind of base. I I imagine like it, I mean, I'm not a defensive coordinator, but if I was, I would say like, okay, who am I, who am I building around on that side of the ball? And it's, it's those two guys really. And maybe you throw in quite, but he's not quite, he still needs a level of like development. If you want someone at like all three levels, it's like, it's those two. And then you have some guys who still need a level of like development, obviously in like LVN and Quay and probably Stokes because who knows what he's going to look like coming back from injury and Carrington Valentine and I'm probably blanking on a number of other, Devonta Wyatt, even like a TJ Slayton who looked really good this year, but like is like a certain type. There's like so much talent there. Um, they're going to need to totally revamp the safety position. I think that's like a conversation for another day because if he wants to play cover one, I don't know what the heck they're going to do with <laughs> the safety position right now. But, um, But he has my point being like these pieces that I'm really excited to see what he does with because everything that he's preaching is the total opposite of what we have seen. And we have always said like the pieces on defense just don't seem like they fit in the scheme that we're watching. Right. We have corners that feel like they are really sick. And, and we don't, I don't even like need to see like press man 24 seven. That's not going to work in the NFL, Mm -hmm. but our corners are built to be aggressive, whatever that aggression looks like, right? We have now built a, we, the Packers have built a front to rush the passer in a number of different capacities. Like he has, I've listened to a bunch of interviews with him where he really likes like different six man pressure fronts. Mm -hmm. And it's like, they have the personnel to do really different creative things with that. And so I imagine for him, it must be really exciting to get into a building where he has so much like moldable clay to do and fit what he wants to do, whether it translates well in the field or not. I mean, TBD. Yeah. I'm on uh, the corners. I'm yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see how they go. I mean, you mentioned the press man thing. Like yeah, they can't do that all the time as much as they want to, but even at BC, like they weren't press manning because they, they didn't have the dudes for it, mm-hmm. but they were playing, five to seven yards off flat footed. And when, and when the snap came, I mean, they're either flat footed, they're playing downhill. It wasn't turn your hips and retreat. And let, like, they were even playing off. They were attacking, which like knowing Jair, knowing Carrington Valentine, like that's what those dudes want to do. Whether you're pressing or not, those dudes want to play downhill. So I'm, ex- I'm excited about that. I'm excited about, um, I was been like the whole like three, four versus four, three, where half likes to play four, three. I think Guda can said impressor. It's they're basically playing four, two, five, which yeah. is true. But regardless, like the way the Packers have built that edge room, they built those guys to be pocket crushers. Anyway, they don't have bendy edges. They don't like that anyway. So like Preston, LVN and Gary are all speed to power, crush the pocket. Look, like those are, even if you want to say four, three, those are kind of like your old school four, three DNs anyways. <laughs> like it's not, you don't even have to switch anything. Like you've got the personnel cause you've kind of built it this way. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm hyped about Quay as a blitzer. Cause he's a lot of six man pressure stuff that I don't, what I'll say is I don't think he is um, cause he came from uh Petten, he, but he, he coached on a Petten. I don't think he's nearly as creative a blitzer as Petten from what I've seen, but he's, 
effective. Like it's not a whole bunch of crazy stuff, but he blitzes at good times and the stuff he runs is is good and solid and he'll send good guys on it. So I'm I'm excited to see whatever blitz package he's going to throw out there, especially with them because we've seen I, I I've got seared in my brain, dude. The the with the rep was that against Dallas where Quay like just sidestepped the the running back trying to pick him up with a hole like you can't teach that stuff. Like that's just get Quay rushing the passer by whatever means necessary through the B gap. Like just Please, please. And I think I think you'll do that. I'm very excited about that. Yeah, I'm glad you both mentioned the six man pressures, because I think that's one of the things that's like so intriguing about this. We had talked about like the versatility that Quay has had since he was drafted, right, that he can line up closer to the line that he can drop back. I think it was his rookie season where he stonewalled Justin Fields and we were like any other inside linebacker. That's a touchdown. And for Quay, he was athletic enough to make the play. And one of the things I think it was Ben Fennell, who does fantastic film work, obviously, as well mentioned his use of uh, nickel pressures, which I know Keyshawn Nixon's a free agent and we probably, you know, you probably don't want him to be like your every down nickel corner, but I think that he's like ideal for some of these nickel pressures. If that's something that Halfley likes to run. And to your point, Dusty, yeah, like you've got so many guys that are so physical and all they want to do is attack the ball. And I think it gives them a lot of options too here now in the draft to take some more like, versatile like tweener inside linebacker safeties there's actually some really good names in free agency that we'll get to i'm sure later in the off season but lots of options for the packers as they kind of revamp that like that that last five yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah i'm i'm the safety thing i'm because you need a couple different kinds of safeties i'm i was talking myself into maybe savage like is that roaming guy because he says like the skill sets kind of for that but we've never actually seen him do that well so i'm talking myself into savage like no they need they need a they need a center fielder over and they don't they don't have like that's the biggest like regardless of anything else like they need that and like you said they need someone who can rotate down pick up the run, cover a tight end up the seam. Like they need, they need someone. I mean, really honestly, like what Brian branch was uh, last year with Detroit. Like if they had a dude like that, like he'd be absolutely perfect for this. What's the safety class look like this stretch? I think it was Andy. Somebody said that Daniel Joe Maya doesn't have any safeties in his top 50. So nice. I mean, <laughs> who said in his presser, not, too many days ago that like they feel like they have the money and the capital mm -hmm. to make moves in free agency. And there are a number of, um, there are a number of safeties up for free agency. I mean, they have like the pick of the litter, I think. And it was actually speaking of Ben Fennell, Maggie, um, Ben Fennell, I think who said, you know, they're not getting paid like they used to yeah. anymore. So, cause I think the payouts have not, really been living off like jesse people. bates got the bag last year but yeah. i think falcons were like bidding against themselves I think of like chauncey gardner johnson who like was a good player and he got what like three and a half per year like it wasn't yeah. wasn't much so i really think i think like there are names out there that the packers could go for and and fans might be like no they're gonna be too expensive i don't know if they actually now that i'm hearing where the mm -hmm. market is at in terms of viewing safeties I actually think they might be in the running for some of the bigger names, um, which is pretty exciting because they for sure, I mean, they needed one. We knew this before this season. We knew it mid season. We know it now. And I think especially now bringing this new defensive coordinator in and hearing everything he's been saying about the scheme, it's going to be like even more vital um, because look, if he plays more aggressive, amazing. We're so sick of watching the dink and dunk and the playing soft and all that that opens you up for what right the potential to give up a big, a big play now granted the packers were giving up a big play anyway so <laughs> it doesn't matter but you know if that's the case like you need a reliable trusted safety on the back end and they don't have that right now like it regardless of the system you need a safety who can like play in space and the packers have not had that in a yeah. very long time so yeah and tackle so like they need one anyway all right like regardless yeah. of who is dc they need one anyway they just really need one now yeah um dusty what else i mean i know you've watched a fair amount of tape now is there anything that like has stood out to you that you're like 
oh, I really like that. I hope he like brings that to the Packers. Like that's like translatable to what this defense has. Well, that was the thing I was kind of looking at. Um, I was trying to look at it through the lens of, yeah, what, what's he running? And then how, how does it look with the Packers? And, and some of that is like, as we kind of talked about it, how much of it is, how much does he really want to run when he was running Ohio State and just couldn't with BC? But I think he's going to port some of the BC stuff over. I really liked, it's something I think the Packers have not done super well is depth with the safeties, or it's not depth, let's say depth with the linebackers and passing downs, where you you watch a team like what Fred Warner's doing, and Fred Warner's, I mean, like one of one, but the way they play that defense, they will get immediate depth and deep depth to take away those kind of like deep digs, deep crossers so that the safeties can kind of bother themselves with deeper things or trying to rob different things. And so the depth with the linebackers from where they're able to sit at the line, I think with a guy like Quay, you could do something like that like pretty easily. Again, like the pressure stuff's really exciting. Um, and I think that's going to be just an absolute ton of fun. And the way they'll um, – I think uh, Dan Orlovsky meant said something like, was it chaos at the line of scrimmage? Like there is a lot of milling around. And again, I don't think it's nothing like if you're looking at it for all of his faults, I loved watching Petten's defense because that dude, when he dialed up blitzes, like it was some weird, nasty stuff. And I just <laughs> absolutely adored it. I don't think he's doing anything like that. So it's not super exciting to watch, but I think it's a fun package and what he's got with like, with those guys at the line and how much he will mix up where they rush from where they set. There's a lot of shifting before linebackers kind of milling around a little bit. So I think what he's going to do with causing confusion at the line with that defensive line is going to be fun. But I think like I was watching that BC defense and watching some of those linebackers and the depth that they were trying to get. And again, they couldn't really do it. Uh, watching some of them trying to get going. But Quay's gonna like Quay should eat in this defense with the depth he'll able to be able to get, rob some of those crossers, rob some of those digs, and then I was also bring in on blitzes. That was I, that, I was watching a lot of like the DB stuff since he was a DB coach, and I like to watch um, like rotations on the back end, like how the safeties rotate, how do they pick up um, at all the different like route stems and all this stuff, and when that stuff breaks. And there's some really good stuff there as well. But I kept being drawn to those linebackers going it seems like he's got an idea of what to do with these guys. And that would be hopeful. I think fit perfectly into what Quay's skill set as we see with how athletic he is. Uh, and I think he's, he could be aligned for a very big year in the system. I'm, I'm very excited about that. I think what's so interesting too, like about the pieces here is that the Packers have undervalued the inside linebacker position for so long. And then we've seen the trend in the NFL where having two really good inside linebackers is becoming more and more of a necessity because of the speed in the middle of the defense. So it used to seem like completely outlandish that the Packers would even look at inside linebackers high. And then they finally kind of broke the seal and took Quay Walker. And now you have to wonder if it's, you know, going to be a top 50 pick for them again this season, because I mean, like if you look at the the Ravens defense that everybody wanted coaching staff from with Roquan Smith and Patrick Queen, like the Buccaneers defense a couple years ago with Levante David and Devin White, you mentioned already, of course, Fred Warner and Dre Greenlaw, like having a tandem of inside linebackers that can control the middle of the, the defense dictates everything on the field. And it seems like Halfley's the kind of guy, especially with the kind of like the six man pressures and the stunts that is going to need somebody opposite Quay to bring matching athleticism so that they're not caught, like you said, flat footed with, I love Isaiah McDuffie. I'm glad he's back. You know, I think he's going to have a role on the defense, but not sure he's the kind of every down backer for this defense. Well, especially with the safeties too, because if you're trying to like linebackers got to get depth, they got to carry a tight end up the seam, but the safety has to pick that up. And then he's got other responsibilities as well. And so if you have a safety that can't cover in space, then I'm Isaiah McDuff, who's not great in coverage. It's like, yeah. all right, it's just going to be tight ends for 15 yards every single down <laughs> at a certain point. Yeah. And, oh man, I mean, Frankie Louvu. Oh, that mean number one on my list right there. Bro, <laughs> bring him in, man. <laughs> I think, I think, me too, Dusty. Um, just because, like, I feel like pairing Quay, and, like, this is no hate to Devondre. I mean, obviously, Devondre's all-pro season was phenomenal, and if we could have Devondre at that level again, like, I would take it any day of the week, but it just doesn't seem like that's where he's at anymore. And, like, to your point, Maggie, I mean, they made the investment, right? Like, they went and got that pairing, and unfortunately the two just never aligned in terms of their like peaking and you can see that Quay is peaking right and you want this new guy to come in and get him to that like next level and you want to make sure you get that pairing right with where Quay is going to be at um 
I watch like a Fred Warner and a Dre Greenlaw. And I, I just think like that it's a game changer. It's an absolute game changer. It's the same with when the Bucks had the the season that they won the Super Bowl. It's just you when they when those inside linebackers fly around, they absolutely wreck offenses. Um, and now offenses are obviously naturally kind of game planning around those kinds of inside linebackers, and it's like the cat and mouse. But the Packers have won. Now they have to find that pairing, and it even could be if they wanted maybe a safety that plays closer up to the line, if they wanted a safety that played in the box, like I'm thinking about like an Adrian Amos in his, in his prime as like that super just like sturdy box safety. Also, with, you know, like, like late stage Morgan Burnett. Yeah. yeah with right? the Browns, like, Morgan Burnett. Like, yeah. yeah. But I don't know. I don't know what they want to do in terms of like investment. Um, and also Isaiah like Simmons that. as a free agent. Maybe he needs a career rejuvenation. Fun. I mean, there's also. I've, some, I've been dreaming really about awesome whatever that guy can do for sure. I don't. I don't know if he's ever going to turn into anything. <laughs> we don't anything know if like he can hit that ceiling anymore. Oh but gosh, yeah. yeah. Um. I mean, obviously, I don't know what's going to happen there, but like Buda Baker. Um. <laughs> Buda Baker. I don't know. It's it's going to be a really interesting off season for sure, given like. Also, just like that grouping, I feel like inside linebacker safety has always just been like, there's a lot of creativity with what you can do in terms of, you know, just like the way that players are coming out of college too. Like you're not, when you're playing the middle of the field, right, you're getting like really shifty slot like receivers, like Jaden Reeds that you have to cover, but then you're also getting like big, six six luke musgrave tight ends so it's just like how do you develop like an in middle of the field cover defense that's going to be able to attack all spectrums of an offense and it's again you go back to the 49ers and it's like they just have two inside linebackers that are phenomenal at everything and you're just like get lucky i mean i hate to use the l word lucky but you just sometimes get lucky with with players that can do it all. Um, I don't know. Well, and if you think of like, the, you think of like when you're <laughs> trying to run those pressure things too, like if you're bringing Quay on a blitz, which sounds really fun, like you've got to replace him somehow in coverage, right? Like, unless it's like a, like cover zero type of look. And so in that case, you're likely spinning a safety down. You've got like a two higher, you got a guy in the box and now a safety has got to pick up whatever his responsibility was, whether that's somewhere middle of the field or that's somewhere carrying a guy up the seam. And so it is, then you do, you do then run into the, like, it's good to have linebackers. It's also good to have a safety who can, who can play in the box or do some coverage stuff where then also play a little bit in space. Like you need to be able to be versatile, especially with those two positions with as much as if you want to bring that pressure, like you need guys that can do that stuff. So I think getting, getting maybe a slightly undersized safety and a slightly bigger linebacker, like that's, that's a pretty good pairing if you're going to kind of rotate those guys and, and switch off their responsibilities a little bit and confuse the offenses. Yeah. All right. I asked Maggie this and I want your opinion too. Like, is there a role for Darnell Savage in this new defensive scheme? If they can get him, because I feel like his, I might be wrong on this. I feel like his best year was under Patton where it was kind of more like he was rangy and roamy a little bit more. Like I, they drafted him. Cause I mean, that is ideally if, if his if he hits what he's supposed to be, right, which was what they drafted him for, is kind of this rangy playing space safety who can also rotate down and play the slot, which is like exactly what I was talking about. You get a guy who can roam the back end, play center field, rob the post, go sideline to sideline, but then if you need to, when you bring a pressure of the linebacker, you can rotate that guy down and pick up a slot. Like ideal, like that would be that is Savage's skill set. The issue with Savage is like we've not seen that consistency now is that we haven't seen that consistency because he's being asked to do things that don't fit. He's playing like I'm, I'm a fan of the too high stuff. Um, but, but if you think of like what a safety is doing, a lot of this stuff, it's more like you're playing in a phone booth or you're passing stuff off. You're looking at the crossers in front of you. You're playing downhill as opposed to if you're single high, you're rotating back. You see that stuff play out in front of you. You can read and react a little bit more. You can fly the ball. So I kind of, I, it feels like almost like a Homer thing where I'm like, I'm dreaming on what like his rookie season was and ideally what they drafted him to be. 
But mm-hmm. if this doesn't necessarily unlock him, but if he's better at that, at being that kind of like eyes in the middle of the field, read and react, play downhill, don't have to worry about passing all that stuff off. Then when you need to rotate, rotate down and play the slot, and we've seen him play the slot and be perfectly fine in that. I think yeah. the ideal version of Darnell Savage, if he hits that, I think he could be, I mean, there is a, what, 10% chance, but he could be their starting single high safety that you rate to rotate down and play the slot. I, I'm not ruling out the possibility that he could be their day one starting safety. Like, I think there absolutely could be a role for him here. However, not overly banking on that just because we've, again, we've not seen that consistency. So I think he's, he's either that or I, or I think he's out because I don't think you're playing him. I mean, if you want to play a lot of single high, what's what, what else are you doing? That is box safety. Like he's not, he's good around the line, but he, he's not, He's not. He's never shown himself to be a good box safety. He's going into what is he, year six? Like he's not just yeah. going to be a special teamer. So I think he's either your starting safety. Maybe he takes a backup role or something. Or I think he's. I think he's. I think he's probably out the door. So my hope, because I really like Savage, my hope would be that he picks up on that single high stuff. That he can become like this. Unlock something in him. He can be that. Uh, but I think if it doesn't, I just. I don't. I don't know if there's a big spot for him. It's funny that Mike Patton is getting so much love on this show now that we're talking about a new uh, DC. But yeah, it, that's the 2020 season. Exactly what I was thinking about when he was the free safety he had four picks. Like he just got to float and Adrian Amos was like the in the box. I think that was when they were like the highest graded tandem for the second half of the season. Like just a phenomenal end of the year for them. And then everything like the wheels fell off in 2021. Not sure what else changed in 2021, but the wheels fell off of that secondary in 2021. And yeah, I mean, I think I agree with you 1000% that if he could get back to like floating free safety, there is an avenue, especially because he played nickel in college. Like it'd mm-hmm. be fun to experiment with what he can do, especially if we're talking about Nixon probably not being the long term solution at nickel. But I also think the nickel now, like a starting nickel corner is just like a position that you have to draft yeah. instead of just allocating like one of your resources to nickel. It's becoming kind of its own spot. So I think there's plenty of options, especially a corner in the draft. But yeah, it'd be fun to see 2020 Savage. I just don't know. I don't know if this uh, the system broke him or if we can see the old Savage with a new DC. I have been thinking about Savage so much since this. It was like my first thought with this hire, because, again, I also think for player development, when you've gone through this many coordinators and this many changes, it's like, how much does that impact your ability to be successful and like they also would have to take a flyer contract on him, which would be like probably just a one year situation. Would he want to test the market? Would the market be favorable towards him? Probably not given where the safeties are at and how many he would be going up against like competition wise, given like the names that are floating around out there. There's just a very, very, very interesting, again, same as last year question around Darnell Savage. Um, you guys bring up some good points that I hadn't thought of. So I'm glad I asked the question. I would be so happy if he was finally found his success, because again, he was just such a athletic fun prospect with such a high upside that you just can't help, but feel like the flashes have always been really exciting. Like I the mean, speed's still there, right? Yeah, like the yeah. instincts are still yeah, there um, too. Instincts, like He jumps that route. Um, you know, that play against Jack in the, in the wild card round, like that was not just like a gimme touchdown. Like he read that ball and jumped that route. And I do wonder with everything you're saying, like being in that more of the free floating, you know, read the field, if he'd have more opportunities for plays like that versus being, having to pass guys off and having more of the unfortunate moments that we saw in the 49ers game, right. Where he's not where he's supposed to be and he's having to come down and he's missing tackles and things of that nature. So um, I don't know, I guess we'll find out. Um, But Savage is like a big, big question mark for me this off season. Here's my question for you guys with, with, uh, with a BC coach coming in was, is BJ Raja going to make his return? Is he, I think he's coming back, Maggie. He's going to come in and coach the defensive line. (laughs) my heart would stop so don't joke (laughs) he comes out from hiding (laughs) yeah no one's heard from him in five years he's like i'll coach the d-line like all right welcome back bj 
And that's, I mean, you bring up a good point there, Dusty, though, is that like now we're probably going to get in a whole new slew of coordinator or um, position coaches. Well, I just saw, um, and I, I didn't know if it was confirmed or not, but I just saw it looks like he's going to, he's getting, um, he's, he's trying to get the Ohio State DB coach to come coach DBs in Green Bay. So I do think there's going to be a big change there, but it sounds like that was just like right before I hopped on. I saw some, some I saw some report about that. That's so. interesting because the the one spot I thought he might stick with was Ryan Downard, since they had worked together previously. And I know he's like primarily safeties, but yeah, yeah, that'd be interesting. I saw Will Blackman too was like tweeting about where he wants to coach, and everyone's like, "Hey, Boston College guy <laughs> who is a former DB, come on that'd down awesome. to Green Bay." But wow. So much change, so exciting. Any uh, any final thoughts? I'm the, my my biggest frustration. I'm I'm glad they didn't wait until after the Super Bowl. I'm glad the hiring's done. I'm glad we got a new DC. I am now very frustrated that we don't get a chance to see what this looks like on the field until September. Like I want to I want to see it now. Like we've been we've been looking at it. I'm like looking at we, we got the draft coming up and thinking of how these players are going to fit in the ones we have now. I want to see what it looks like. I want to see it now and I don't want to wait. That's like the only thing I'm frustrated about. Everything else I'm 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 excited. I'm excited it wasn't I mean they, they didn't really they they interviewed what uh Staley and I really like Brandon Staley so I'm fine with that. But they weren't bringing in a whole bunch of like older guys who maybe like had, had been like kind of lifer de, uh, defensive coordinators or defensive coaches. Like I like that they brought in, I like the process in general. There's a whole bunch of younger guys. And I, I mean, after going through a whole bunch of this stuff and reading and listening and like hearing guys talk about him, I'm pretty excited about this. Yeah. And I mean, there's just so much to like from his entire coaching history, you know, Revis, somebody that I know he joked about as saying like, he thought he was just a really good secondary coach. And then he was like, oh, well, that's because it's Jarrell Revis. It's a little yeah. different, but Richard Sherman, Jeff Akuda, like there's so many guys that he's worked with along the way that, have, and for them to speak so highly of him and give him so much praise, like those are the guys you go to bat for. And that's one of the reasons I know Packer fans are so high on Christian Parker is because when you have players that come out of the woodwork and coaches that say like, we don't want to lose this guy. He's such an asset to the locker room and former players. Like he said, he still talks to Richard Sherman and you know, he hasn't been with the 49ers since what 2018. So like, I think those things speak volumes about just the relationship that he'll have with the defense and like the buy-in he'll get from those guys. And then you'll see that and how it, it responds on the field. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think my biggest takeaway is like to your both of your points is I'm really looking forward to seeing how he brings that side of the ball together. I think there was like a very clear, I don't want to say it disconnect, but that started to build last season and well into this season. Um, and I know like the guys are professionals and it never boiled over to the point where it was like, any kind of clear to the public issue, but I feel like you could tell that it just, it wasn't right. Whatever chemistry there was meant to be there, just, it just wasn't right. And so you hope that he can come in and kind of build up that rapport on that side of the ball, get the guys excited and rejuvenated and invigorated about what he's calling. And I think the signs to me that it's going to be, go well is that he really says what do i got how do i use what i got well i'll make changes if i have to like his track record says i go with what i'm given and take what my players are best at and like go from there and that's that's what this team needs like that's what this team needs more than anything and i think they're gonna the players are gonna respond really well to that um i want it to happen now like you dusty <laughs> i want it to happen now um I also like, I'd be really curious. I want to hear too what the players think. I, and I'm none of them are going to say anything, obviously, but just out of like sheer curiosity, like I'd love to hear what Jair thinks of this dude and like what like Keyshawn Nixon thinks of this dude. And, you know, I'm sure Rashawn Gary is going to only say good things because that's Rashawn Gary. But I just like, I, I think that side of the ball like really needed um, a little bit of a, I don't know, a zhuzh. Uh, like vibe wise. Um, and so hopefully he can also just from a like relationship standpoint, get in there and, and assist. 
And it seems like he has a lot of, I mean, you mentioned the players. It seems like he has a lot of very good relationships. So it seems like if nothing else, yeah, he's a guy who, who guys love playing for and guys love being around. So that, that should be, that should help the vibes right there. Yeah. Not that Joe Barry yeah. was terrible well, by all, by all mean, accounts, Joe Barry was a good hang, but mm-hmm. like, that's. But I think that, I mean, there's, you can't, you can't overlook that yeah. for sure. Like you, you, you really can't. Um, I think it's important, especially like, really young team. The other side of the ball seems to be gelling like crazy. Um, so you got, it all has to like come together, right? They have to be complimentary vibes. <laughs> um, so, um, all right. This was awesome. Um, I think, you know what, if nothing else, it's good that we're all trending upward and optimistic about the hire right like that in and of itself we don't know what the hell is going to happen however i think to- in totality everyone's excited about it and that's like a good place to be it would be really it would suck if it was like oh they're just going with like the same old same old but they went in and got someone young and someone exciting and we're just gonna have to wait and see how it goes but we're excited about it so there's that uh, Dusty, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so excited to <laughs> come is, and talk to you guys again. This is, is awesome. The best. It is the best having you on. Um, please tell the people where they can find all your amazing work. You can find me at Dusty Vu on Twitter. I'm taking a, a bit of a break from writing at the moment just because it's the off season and I get burned out really easily. So <laughs> I'll resurface at some point at said TV. Uh, but for now, I'm, I'm laying low on the content side of things, except for, uh, you know, podcasts where I will say yes, because I like talking to people and I especially like talking to you all, but uh, not, nothing else writing in the works at the moment. Nice. Maggie? Yeah, I am in the same boat as Dusty. I'm taking a hiatus from Chisa TV because <laughs> the I mean, I might do some draft stuff for them. We'll see. I'll have the Chisa TV draft guide coming out here. But yeah, everybody knows where to find me. Make sure you just follow Dusty because he's uh, he's the cream of the crop in the Packer world. And we're always lucky to talk to him. And I think that the three of us should go see this new defense in person um, for the Lambo opener. Oh, let's go. As we per will, tradition. We will definitely be doing that, I think. <laughs> well, two for two and wins. We absolutely need to do that. Yeah, for sure. Go three for three. <laughs> Um, thank you all for listening. Uh, this has been Pax What She Said with Dusty Evely. You can follow us on Twitter at PWSS Podcast. Follow Maggie at Maggie J. Loney. Follow me at Perry underscore Goldstein. Uh, follow, like, subscribe on YouTube, Pax What She Said. Um, if this is where you are listening to the show, thanks. If not, download, like, subscribe uh, wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, we will be back next week with... We are the off season guys, some off season (laughs) content. It is TBD. Now we are flying through the off season. Um, so yeah, stay tuned. We'll announce whatever the topic may be. Um, the Packers will surprise us. I'm sure. Uh, but for now, and as always go pack, go, go pack, go, go pack, go.